All right, I'm gonna call to order this December 1st, 2020 meeting of the North Andover Planning Board. Um, first, I'll read a statement. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18 and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Andover Planning Board will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members uh, of the public and or parties with the right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website at www.northandoverma.gov. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to listen may do so on their television by turning in Comcast Channel 8, Verizon Channel 26, or online at www.northandovercan.org. No in-person attendance of members of the public, of members of the board, or of applicants will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by a technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of North Ender website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceeding as soon as possible after the meeting. If members of the public would like to participate in any public hearings, please email your question or comment prior to or during the meeting to our planning director, Jean Enright. Her email address is j-e-n-r-i-g-h-t at northandoverma.gov. The question or comment will be read during the proceeding and responded to accordingly. Okay, um, and okay. We will start with master plan. So we have, th I think we just had three things on our agenda tonight. Is that right? Well, the fourth is to just um, agree to a continuance for 174 Kituit. Okay, so let's do that first. 174 Kituit Street, 5C Construction LLC. Um, they have requested a continuance until December 15th. Um, and so can we get a motion to approve that continuance? Aton, can I just add, so they submitted a form yep. to, um, so for subdivisions, there's a shot clock of 135 yep. days. I don't think it's necessary to extend that time frame. They're simply asking to continue until the 15th. And so um, I am not recommending signing an extension for the board to file a definitive action. Okay. Okay, so no extension at this time needed. We're going to uh, motion to uh, continue the hearing until December 15th for 174 Kituit Street. So if we so can get a motion to that effect. So okay, we'll made, motion made by John. Aaron, I'll second. Aaron seconds, all in favor, John? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Uh, Peter? Yes. Uh, I'll vote yes. Uh, okay, so that's continued. Okay, uh, Three Ray Pond Road has already been continued. Is that right, Jean? Yes, they, at the last meeting, continued to a date certain of the 15th, as well as 419 and 435 Andover Street was continued to December 15th. Okay, great. So, uh, so the things that we have left then are master plan implementation committee, Royal Crest Estates, and 1270 Turnpike Street, correct? Yes, and 1270 is a new public hearing to open. New public hearing, though we have had some information about it previously when it was requested to be a uh, insubstantial change. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so why don't we do, let's, we're going to go and hopefully what's going to be the quickest first. So let's start with master plan implementation committee progress report, Kelly Cormier and Stan Limpert. All right, great, thank you. So uh, members of the planning board, uh, I'm joined with Stan Limpert um, to present our first uh, quarterly, uh, our inaugural uh, quarterly progress report for the master plan implementation committee. At this point, we, uh, the committee has met uh, four times. I wanna wrote the progress report, it was only three, but we've now met four. Um, I was nominated to be the chair and Stan as the vice chair. Uh, the team has not, the committee has nine members on it. And uh, as we get started, we've been focused on two main things. One, uh, understanding kind of our communication strategy and plan moving forward, as well as working 
through prioritizing the elements of the master plan, understanding what's there, the elements and the strategies, uh, developing a framework for doing that and working through that prioritization. And Stan spent quite a bit of time with a few committee members uh, developing a framework and Stan's just going to um, give us a, a quick update or explanation of what's been done there so far. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> As you, uh, as you all recall from the plan, um, in the back of the plan is the uh, so-called uh, strategies table. There are 103 strategies listed in that table. And uh, we've started uh, developing an approach to try to uh, rank those or prioritize those so that we can help the, the appropriate groups who are supposed to work on those or implement those uh, get started on those on those tasks. Uh, we initially started by uh, looking at what we have called the costs. They're the the elements that were already given in that table. They include um, the the relative budgetary cost estimates in a sort of a very aggregate way. The degree of difficulty for the task and the time frame for those tasks, whether they're short, medium, or long term. And we came up with a numeric uh, sort of rating that combined those three factors uh, to give us something that we could more easily work with. So things that are very expensive, very difficult, and uh, take a long time or are well out on the time horizon are have the, have the, uh, the, the highest values uh, would be the most difficult to work on. Um, at, the, at the same time, because there was no specific benefit uh, listed in the table itself, uh, we decided to come up with our own kind of uh, ad hoc way to estimate what the benefits of each task might be. And we did that by trying to assign three different factors to each of the, the strategies, the 103 strategies. One is the uh, if you will, the coverage of the strategy. What proportion, what percentage of the residents of our town are affected by it? In some cases, it's all residents. In some cases, it's just some residents. So that's one factor. The second factor is the impact uh, of the change itself. Some uh, tasks, some strategies have very minimal impact, even though they may affect all residents while others could have a very large impact. For example, the uh, renewal of all our sewer and water uh, supply system in North Andover. Uh, the third factor was, uh, you know, if you will, a subjective view on the, the benefit, the effect uh, of the, this particular strategy uh, on the town. So we used the same kind of numerical approach and then came up with the number for a benefit. We could then use those numbers to begin sorting uh, all the strategies into various, in various ways to look at those that had the highest benefit and the lowest cost, uh, uh, those that had uh, uh, high benefits but relatively high cost, that different ways of looking at all of that. You also may recall that this uh, the, the strategies were broken up into seven different elements. That's the term used in the plan. The elements include land use, housing, uh, economic development, uh, open space, historical and cultural resources, transportation, and public facilities. We uh, broke ourselves up into groups and we're assigned ourselves to each of those areas. So we're all looking now at one of those, one or two of those areas to try to rank, if you will, the strategies in those areas. I, I, I you may recall um, that uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about is we don't wanna try to overload the people who have to do the, the, the actual work itself have to implement these strategies, these tasks, if you will. And there are three groups uh, that have the preponderance of the responsibility for the strategies, the tasks in the master plan of which you, the planning board are one. Um, you have a leadership role on 18 strategies. 
primarily in land use and housing, um, but related to zoning in a couple of other areas, um, and are also uh, a supporting group for 12 other tasks. So there's the, the potential there to have way more to do than you can possibly accomplish in you know, any reasonable period of time. So we're trying to figure out ways to meter the tasks into the system to you, if you will, so that you can start working those that we all collectively feel are the, are the most important. So that's what we're gonna be doing next is looking at trying to get a smaller number of these uh, strategies uh, winnowed out so we can find the ones that we feel are the most important and then start talking to the groups like yourselves that are uh, responsible for the potential implementation of these strategies and see how then we can best help you to get these uh, started or going or whatever. So that's where we're at. Kelly. Great. All right, so that, that's what we've accomplished so far. We continue to move forward, um, really focusing on finishing, as, as Dan said, finishing the framework for the priorities uh, along the strategies, as well as then starting to communicate out and making sure everyone is getting credit for the great things that are happening. I, uh, so one kind of question comment. Um, one thing that you may also want to think about, which you probably have, is the timing of our town government in that you know town when town meeting occurs and that if there are things that you have as priorities or are they kind of are easy and can be checked off but require you know warrants and town meetings and stuff like that just to keep in the back of your mind as you're going through priorities and say okay if you highlight something well actually how long is that going to take and if it is a priority can it be done this year versus next year and things like that right and and what we what we hope to be able to do is identify some of those those strategies, those tasks, and then suggest them to groups like yourself, the planning board, who could then uh, generate warrant articles if that was appropriate for something, whatever it is. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the land use uh, strategies, tasks are zoning related. So, you know, that would be something you could generate if you felt like it, you know, zoning articles that related, uh, uh, warrant articles that related to zoning. So yeah, that's a good point. And we'll, We'll certainly keep that in mind as we start this process of trying to to uh, come rank these uh, strategies, and uh, we'll keep in mind if there are things that seem more near term, what might require uh, some uh, town meeting action, both either in terms of uh, approvals for things or funding for other. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Point well taken. Right. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Uh, all right. So why don't we now move to 1270 Turnpike Street? I'm going to go, just give me one second. Okay. Application for a site plan review special permit modification under Article 8, Part 3, and Article 10, 195, 10.7 in the North Andover Zoning Bylaw. The applicant proposes to restripe existing parking spaces and add nine new parking spaces, as well as additional site improvements to the rear of the existing building, which includes adding a fence, regrading loam, regrading loam and seating, and adding a new retaining wall to improve accessibility to open space. No changes to the existing building are proposed. Property is located in the village commercial district. Now, this is a public hearing and pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the North Andover Planning Board will be conducted by remote participation. Specific information in the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public, by members of the board and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website at www.northandoverma.gov. Members of the public uh, who wish to uh, listen to the meeting may do so on their television by tuning to Comcast Channel 8, Verizon Channel 26, or by going to www.northandovercam.org. No in-person attendance of members of the public, of the applicants, of members of, or members of the board will be permitted. 
but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of North Andover website an audio or video recording, a transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible. If members of the public would like to participate in this public hearing, please email your question or comment prior to or during the meeting to Jean Enright. Her email address is j-e-n-r-i-g-h-t at northendovermma.gov. The question or comment will be read during the proceeding and responded to accordingly. Uh, so the way this will work, again, just for anyone on the call, if you're not actively speaking, please mute your microphone. Uh, Jean, I'd like you to, if you could, just give us an update of what we're doing, where this has um, kind of come from, and what. Um, and it's a new public hearing, so I want to kind of start from the beginning, even though we have some knowledge of this. And then we'll hear from the applicant, and then we'll do questions and comments from the board and members of the public. Okay, um, so as you alluded to, on October 20th, 2020, the board voted to not approve an insubstantial insubstantial change request to allow for additional parking spaces, revisions to the landscape design, and clearing regrading of a wooded area at the rear of the lot. This clearing was previously approved by the Conservation Commission and an order of conditions was granted in April of 2019. Construction of the proposed additional parking spaces will need their approval as well. The application before you is for a modification to a 2001 site plan review special permit. Based on input from DPW, the three spaces previously proposed at the rear of the pump station have been removed and the aisle width has been widened to 15 feet. To accomplish this aisle width and the two parallel parking spaces, an interior landscape strip has been narrowed from six to three feet. Seven new parking spaces are proposed along Turnpike Street. The board expressed some concern for the proposed spaces within the sewer and access easement on the property. I've reviewed the easements with town council and she felt the additional parking spaces were not prohibited. Today, late today actually, two mock-up plans were received and so I've added those to the packet. They're available for public viewing as well as your viewing. And I think they really help to, to delineate exactly what is being proposed here. And so they are called mock-up, I think CP1 and CP2. Um, and I will turn it over to the applicant to kind of walk you through what they're requesting. Okay, thank you, Jean. And Ms. Colbert, all right. You're on mute. I know, I got it. Okay. Okay. Um, Deb Colbert from Hank, a professional engineer from Hancock Associates. And I'm here to represent our <clears throat> client, uh, Mr. Sampson, who purchased this property approximately four years ago. In the time that he, in the past four years, he was able to um, rent out only a quarter of the building. And currently it is being used um, as an office space. However, in the past two years, he has um, had offers to come in to rent out the property and lease the property and uh, at, at each moment that that has happened, the potential tenants have said that there is not enough parking. Uh, at one point in time, he did speak with someone who thought about putting in a daycare center. And um, since then that has not um, come to fruition. Otherwise we would have be here for a whole nother um, situation. He is hoping to expand the parking lot so as to rent out the commercial property. Um, we are proposing to expand um, the parking lot in the easement by adding seven spaces over there. And as you come into the property, three spaces on the left. Um, we are also proposing when we were looking to um, possibly have uh, a daycare center. He looked to expand the back so that it would be more usable friendly for a daycare center. And um, he continues to uh, want to have that space for open space considering COVID and uh, the opportunity to allow for tenants to go out in the back and enjoy open space. Uh, in the back there. 
we have submitted to Conservation Commission and we are meeting, we met with them once and they are of course waiting to hear what planning board is going to say about this prior to evaluating it all at, and giving any opinions. We did do an, a drainage analysis and currently all of the easement drainage flows by sheet flow into the wetlands. Um, and the parking lot flows into a drainage system that drains into a downstream defender to um, mitigate any, uh, any debris and, and petroleum runoff prior to discharging to the wetlands. We are proposing to collect all of the runoff from the easement into a catch basin and then continue and collect it into the downstream defender to, um, to pre-treat that runoff prior to discharging to the wetlands to improve the situation. And that's what I have. Questions? Do we have like a, do we have a, a satellite view or a street view of this in the packet anywhere? Uh, no, however, I do have photos if I'm allowed to share. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm looking at it. I'm just, uh -huh. I just wanted to, so. It's on the last packet this, I provided the, the aerial. The, the last packet I provided okay. the aerial, I didn't carry it into this packet. No, I'm just trying to get a sense to, for myself. I was just trying to, I think I knew the property. So now I'm looking at it. It's a seven hills, right? Yep. Seven hills in North Andover. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's already got a parking lot in the front, right? Yes. Okay. So there's a number of waivers just trying in to the imagine. application because some, I mean, yeah. village residential, wants the parking in the rear or to the side but it was approved in 01 and the parking lot was put in the front so there were waiver provisions provided for in 01 it's an existing condition today so uh, uh, i guess the question i would have is you're adding 10 spaces is do i have that correct uh no we're adding uh nine spaces so there's uh, the most of them are like right at the very front perpendicular to the uh, 114 right yes and the other two are on the side on the left is that is that it yes but then there there's two parallel also in the pump station easement currently what has happened is the um the size of the parking spaces that are painted today do not meet North Andover regulations. So we propose to restripe that and then also add a handicap spacing on where the existing parking lot is today. So that reduces the number of existing parking spaces in the paved area today so John, by bringing that up to code so then the net increase is eight plus one handicap okay now the new spaces in the front was that already cleared area and paved area or was it uh green before so as you come into the parking the the parking lot on the left there is some hedges where the three parking spaces are proposed um and then if you were to turn to the right towards the pump station easement that um that is paved area and then paved then then um lawn area i i, I okay i i think 
I guess my question a little bit is where the seven new spaces perpendicular to the street, was that paved before or was that open? Before when? It was grass, John. It was it's grass. grass. The, the original site plan called for landscaping there, but that landscaping has not survived since 01. And the original decision did not require it to, re to be there in perpetuity. I think there was a one year, like must survive one year clause as a condition of that approval. So it's yeah. primarily grass now. It will become paved and they're proposing some landscaping addition. Okay, so what is the landscaping and is there gonna be a low fence in the front? I mean, the, you know, again, in the overall scheme of things, this is not a big deal, but you want this to sit reasonably well on the street and if there's seven cars looking out on the 114 with no sort of reasonable screen or buffer, a low fence and uh, and some some landscaping, it, it you know it wouldn't look particularly good. So yeah, no, our client it would would be very happy to put up a low screen fence and or landscaping as per your requests. Okay. Yep, very happy to do what is needed. So Deborah, does the site plan, I don't have it up in front of me, but doesn't the site plan call for a small fence there? There's five feet setback now, correct? It's a five foot setback and it, there's shrubbery there. There's no, I don't, the, the site plan doesn't show a fence currently. But it shows but shrubbery. It, it shows shrubbery all along um salem turnpike there's one two three four five six seven eight nine uh, ten ten pieces of shrubbery that we were intending to put in um i did not state what i what kind of shrubbery would be put in but my client said that he would be more than happy to put in shrubbery and or fencing whichever would be uh, be approved by the planning board so John, I know as, as of last week, we've had discussion about the auto service shop at 1812 Turnpike, which we just released final bond where they provided a hedge-like structure along with street trees. And so in, in lieu of that, I would think a hedge type structure would probably screen best at five. At yeah, I mean, I, is something that is sort of impermeable. I mean, I, I do like the things that we put up, uh, you know, further up. Uh, closer to Merrimack. Uh, I, I think a lot of that had a kind of a little bit more of a uniform look and feel. And I think that sort of works better. But, you know, as long as we work out something that is reasonable, uh, you know, maybe it's a combination of low fencing and screening. Um, it's fine by me. But, you know, you, you, you just want it not to be a negative. That's all. Agreed. So, Deb, I think you could look at Crossroads Plaza, which is the Fuddruckers had been in that plaza, which is approaching yeah, that, that college. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of as the best example, and across the street as well. So, um, the other question I had is from the building on back, you're not proposing doing anything there, or are you? From the building back, we're proposing to do some grading. It's very, very overgrown with invasive shrubbery in the back. And so we're proposing to take that invasive shrubbery out and um, grade up and put up a um, a low fence to make sure that no one goes out to the wetlands. Okay. And that's been approved by the Conservation Commission. Okay, good. That was really my question. Okay, thank yep. you. Yeah. yeah, that all the work behind the building has been approved by the Conservation Commission. Hi, this is Aaron. Uh, I have two questions for the applicant. Uh, first of all, I was wondering what analysis has been done on the existing defender to ensure that um, more more flow from a, um, a, a proposed larger parking lot uh, can be handled. And then my second question is, um, how are the, the, the two parallel spaces next to the pump station, how is it envisioned that those are accessed? Um, my, I guess my concern is just uh, damage to cars or the pump station itself. How, how, do, how do cars maneuver 
in that to park and then to leave. So normally for parallel parking, and we're, we're proposing one way direction traffic. So the, the parking lot would people would come in to the right, swing around the um, pump station on the right, and then you have 15 feet of a alleyway or to maneuver into a 22 foot parallel parking space. So according to all of the design requirements for parallel parking, it's more than sufficient to be able to parallel park there. Um, Are there going to be pavement markings? Yes. To, 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 okay. And yeah, then, to delineate. Yeah, please continue. Yep. And then in regards to the downstream defender, we did do um, a analysis on it. And um, in the stormwater report, um, the calculated runoff with this increased impervious um, is 2.55 CFS for the entire um, property. And that is for the 100 year storm. And then um, we did analyze the downstream defender and, and calculated that there is more than sufficient capacity there. Um, this is a four foot downstream defender that can handle um, Eight, eight CFS, if I'm reading this correctly. Three CFS, and we have to handle 2.55 for the 100 year storm. So yes, it can handle the capacity. Of course, the client will um, need to clean it out and clean out the existing pipes and make sure that they're all working properly. Great. Uh, Peter, any questions, comments? No, thank you. Kelly, any questions or comments? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, just one comment from, from me is that I appreciate that when we said no to the insubstantial change that you had further discussions with DPW, we're able to work out the parking spots there, the aisle issue that we got input from town council. And I think going through the actual formal process has made this a better project and much easier to say yes to. Um, so I appreciate that. So Jean, uh, next steps, so the I, decision. So I think I can draft the decision, Deb, if you can get me a a sketch plan at least of what you propose for landscaping in the front if it's different than what's on the plan today. I'll also need a proposed O&M plan that you just spoke of so we don't have a current O&M plan and I don't know that the original has if there was an O&M plan included in the 01 decision I don't know that it's being executed so I would like to update that. Sure and definitely just let the board know I did not send this out for stormwater peer review I and mean, it, it appears that they've done their due diligence this is going to conservation as well. I've asked the town engineer to weigh in. I haven't heard back from him yet, but I'll follow up again prior to the next meeting to see if I can get um, some comment from him. Great, and, that, and I just want to say, I, I very much agree with John about the hedge screening and a low fence would really make a big difference um, in, the, um, in the project and just making it look more uniform with what we have on 114 and just more presentable in general and allow your um, uh, applicant to do what they like on the inside. And I think it's a good good compromise. So happy with that. Okay. So let's okay. continue this till December 15th and see if we can wrap it up then. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh now we are going to go to all right. uh, Trinity Financial Royal Crest. So uh, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank um, you. Gene, any thoughts on a um, on a how to go through this tonight? Yeah, I think there's some housekeeping from the last meeting. As you know, on November 24th, a lot of information was submitted in response to the November 5th meeting, and the board was asked to review that, digest that, and if you have any question, related questions, I think if we get those out of the way initially. Um, one of the items submitted in that was an abutter comment that in your packet is not only a meeting summary from the abutter, but there's a meeting summary provided from Trinity. I have a couple of comments related to that. If the board has any, I would encourage you to go first. Um, but there was a response specifically to the traffic study information that was provided on November 5th. There's a traffic memo provided. And Peter, you had asked for some density measurement um, to try to get your arms around the proposed density versus existing conditions. And there's a response to that as well. And so if we can kind of go through those items, knock them off. And then tonight, um, Trinity would like to present their open space and recreation plan. There's a presentation um, to review for that. Okay, so can I ask you to kind of line up each of those? Let's do the housekeeping ones, but if you could line them up and say, okay, let's first we'll talk about this, tell us where we're looking, we can ask questions, get comments, get feedback, and then do that for each of the topics, and then we'll move on to the open space. Okay, so first there was, I think, high on the board's list was a traffic response memo for related to traffic count. Um, so that is in the packet. It is the file name traffic counts letter PDF. And I'll just ask the board if you have reviewed that or if Trinity wants to speak to that. Um, I'm just trying to find that one. Traffic counts letter. Okay. Okay, so why don't, yeah, why don't we get someone from Trinity just to kind of uh, summarize what we're looking at and then we'll ask, ask any questions or comments based on yeah. that. This is uh, Mike Lozano from Trinity. Um, we did try to get our traffic engineer to join tonight in case there were any questions. Unfortunately, he had a conflict, um, but this memo addressed um, two of the main questions I think uh, were raised by uh, by the board uh, when we presented the traffic study um, on the November 5th at the November 5th meeting. Um, primarily what it is addressing was the question about what the actual peak is, um, as well as the timing of the peak, uh, and particularly in the morning and where that occurs. So this memo, you know, provided some addi additional information related to that. Um, if there are any specific questions, you know, we're happy to, um, you know, pose those to our traffic engineer and can follow up again. And if, if the board would like, we can make sure that they're at the next meeting. So, so it looks like this data is based on 2016 data, is that right? No. I don't think so. I think they no. did this last year. It was 2019. It was, it was pre COVID. That's right. Oh, the, yeah, the table so I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the table on page two, which shows counts from August of 2016 through October 2016, or that's what it says. So I'm just curious if that's supposed to be 19. Yeah, I, I think it is supposed to be 19. You can see that their, their uh, data, the, the, chart on page three references October in October 2019. Yeah, it says it's for the as 17th, well the, which isn't a date on the chart. Yeah. Well, it's the week two. of, the chart is the week of, right? So like they did it throughout the week. Thursday. Well, this says Thursday, 10, 17, 19. Okay. Can you guys look at that? Because you see what I'm saying on, on page two? I do. I, I see that. And we can figure that out. The other thing I'll note, and maybe Gene, you could speak to this, is that, that the peer reviewer uh, related to traffic has been engaged. So, um, you know, that's that's a process that we'll obviously be going through as well. And we could, we could address this there. Uh, but... 
Okay, so let's, we'll skip, get, come back to us with some clarity on the chart on page two, whether that's supposed to be 19 data or whether we're using 16 data for that. Yeah. Um, let's, so page three of traffic counts letter shows Thursday a.m. peak at, I don't know, you want to help me with the time on that? It said 7.30. I can't tell from this chart. Anybody? Uh, that'd be Mike. Yeah, the, the, after the peak in the morning is at 7.30 is what this is showing. Okay. Look, the question had come up at the meeting that there was some belief that traffic actually peaked prior to 7 a.m., prior to the time period we measured. And what this attempts to do is uh, evidence the fact that it actually peaks within the period that the study captured. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it looks like from this, really starting at even 5.30, we see a real kind of sharp yeah. turn up, but at a sort of a really consistent uh, angle, it seems, yeah. um, from 5.30, to hitting the peak around 7, 7.30, if I'm, yeah, maybe 7.15, um, and then going down. And then the evening, it looks like about 5.15 p.m. Looks to be about the peak. Again, that was done to evidence that uh, the analysis was done off a of peak. People okay. were concerned that the peak might have been at other times. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know Kelly, Peter, you guys had some questions about this. Anything else you want to talk talk, uh, talk about right now? Uh, I, I do agree that one of the important things we're going to have to hear is our traffic consultants, um, the peer reviewers, um, vision on is this the right data to be using? And right. if so, you know, what does the analysis mean as well? So as Mike indicated, we have contracted with Jeffrey Dirk of Vanessa and Associates. He has all the material for review. I've asked him if he thinks he could be prepared to provide something for the December 15th meeting, and I'm waiting to hear back on that. But he is engaged. Okay. And right. I submitted all the questions that the board had to him as well. So I think then that's probably the right time because I, I, as you said, as you said, I was the one, one of the people that mentioned just making sure that we're looking at the right time frame for when the traffic does peak up. So if that's the traffic consultant looks at that, just want to make sure we're we're looking at the the right piece of the mm -hmm. right piece of the day. Okay. And I think the other issue was whether Monday and Friday are relative, and I think this data shows that Friday's peaks are different than the midweek times. And I have a question that maybe we can discuss at more length with our consultant, but uh, I would like to pose it now as well. In the cover memo, <clears throat> um, I think importantly, you, you write about uh, traffic patterns representative of typical weekdays and you write about peak. So if, if we go down to the last page and look at <clears throat> that graph, those, those uh, lines, when you're evaluating the uh, changes in traffic, are you evaluating them against the highest peak or are you evaluating the changes in traffic against um, what you would uh, say is representative of a typical weekday. In other words, if we look at that last page, what point on the graph are you comparing the impact of additional traffic? Are you comparing it to the highest peak or are you comparing it to some other um, point on the graph which you would interpret as typical? Um, I'm, I'm no traffic engineer, but um, it's generally uh, those measurements are done off of peak periods. 
that you want to understand when that intersection is under the most stress. Okay, so it's worst case. Yes. Okay, so, you know, I'd like to maybe hold on to that thought and have that discussion with our traffic consultant because um, I, I just think it's a very important uh, distinction. And I, I, I mean, I will tell you, I, I have been assuming that you're analyzing increased traffic against the peak moments. In other words, worst case, as, as you have described, but I, I just want to make sure that, in fact, that is the basis of the analysis. That is the basis of the analysis, which also, yeah. which also takes into account the traffic that the uh, project is going to generate as well. So it's, it's right, including the traffic generated by Royal Crest. So, so can I correctly interpret what you just says as the analysis will show uh, worst increase at a moment of worst traffic. So in other words, the point of greatest traffic increase from the development compared to the point of heaviest traffic in the existing condition. So it's worst case plus worst case. Yes. I think that's right. If that is in growth, if that is in growth, yep. it doesn't include Royal Crest, and it also includes Royal Crest. Right. Okay. Let's just make sure that uh, with our consultant that that's, that's the uh, basis of the comparison. And uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Okay, Gene, I think that's, so I think that's good for traffic, and I look forward to hearing from our peer reviewer. Uh, for anyone listening, just that may not know, uh, the peer review is someone that is picked and hired by uh, the town of North Andover, and they, on our behalf, review the data and information provided by the applicant, uh, as well as any information that they need, they feel they need on their own, as well as answering questions from the board. Uh, it is paid for by the applicant as part of the process, so that's just how it works. But they, they're kind of the independent. Uh, people that we hire to make sure that um, um, that we're asking the right questions and we're getting the right answers and information. Um, okay, Gene, well, where to next? Uh, can I uh, comment? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, so we had a chance to briefly discuss their input on the traffic question. Can we have a similar discussion about their input with the table showing different measures of change in density or were you suggesting we examine that uh, table at another time? Um, well, we Hold on, Eitan, uh, yeah. I have a question to you. Should, can we have that brief discussion on the table showing different measures of density now, like we just did on the traffic graphs, or, or were you thinking we should discuss those measures of density at a different time. Um, so I was going to have Gene just go through the different items that we've discussed. That being one of them. I don't know if that was next in line, but yes. Okay, good. good. No, I'm, I'm on board with that. I just wanted to be clear on what your plan was. Thank you. Yes. So Peter, that's one of the follow-up items. In addition to, there's a landscape plan that responds to the discussion of the three houses that front on Turnpike Street. So we can do the program summary first, but then there's another house item as well. Okay, so, good. What, what, whatever uh, order you, you want, Jean. Thank okay, you. Okay, nope. So let's do the program summary next. Um, and this okay. program summary was updated to include a bedroom measurement as well as a floor area ratio measurement that compares existing conditions to proposed conditions. So again, Mike, I'll look to you to work the board through that. Yeah, so and, uh, Mike, if I could ask you just to pause, Jean. In the program summary, there's there's two files. Which one are we operating off of? So the revised summary. So the file name is 2011-23 REV program summary 11.23.20 version 2 PDF. Perfect. No, I'm interrupting a lot here, but thank you for following along. That, that's okay, Peter. The reason this one was revised is this one adds the existing condition. The previous one did not have the existing. It only had zoning provision versus proposed. Yeah. 
So, uh, so I'll just describe it, um, and then we can answer any questions that that the board has related to this. Um, as Jean mentioned, a lot of this has been out, uh, and you guys have seen a good portion of it. But we did add in as much of the existing uh, condition information as we could to compare the existing Royal Crest to what is proposed. So what this what this chart is showing is it's showing all of the new the components in the upper sections of this uh, spreadsheet. It's showing all the components that we are that we are proposing as it relates to the master plan. So the first section is a uh, the mixed income multifamily that's contemplated to be utilized utilize uh, a friendly Chapter 40B process, which we've talked about. Um, it lists the three different buildings, their square footages, their residential, the, the number of residential units, and in some cases, some of these are mixed income buildings, so it references the amount of retail that's in those buildings. Mike, and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pause again. Jean, sure. we, should we put this table, can you put that up on the Zoom just so that everyone can see it, or can we not do that? We can do that, which is as long as we identify what we're looking at. Sure. If you don't mind, Mike, I'd like to pause so that perhaps sure. you put that revision table up. And your your explanation walking through here is very helpful. So please okay. wait until we get that up on the screen. Okay. You're on mute, Gene. Gene, we can't hear you. Sorry, I just want to remind Peter that by putting it on the screen, it's for presentation sharing to the people on this phone call. The public will not see this document, so everything needs to be spoken to very specifically. Very good. Thank you, Gene. Understood. Can you see it? Can. Okay. 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 And so uh, this is it. This is yeah. This is it. This is uh, Aton. For anyone who's listening, we are looking at the two zero one one two three REV program summary eleven dot two three dot two zero v.2.pdf, which is a chart uh, multicolored with, I'll describe it as orange at the top with the mixed income 40B multifamily, then a beige's color for market rate multifamily. Uh, we have a 55 plus active living. We have townhomes, student housing, hotel, office, town square, structured parking. All of those have different colors in the chart. And Mike, Lozano is going to kind of walk us through those numbers, as well as the square footage and uh, floor area ratio from existing to what's proposed. And Mike, if you could just kind of also just give a little description of what floor area ratio actually means for anyone who might not know. Absolutely. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Um, so to continue on, um, the next section down is uh, called the market rate multifamily. So again, this is the next section of buildings. It includes, again, in some of the buildings, there's mixed use. So there's a summary of the square footage related to retail, the residential square footage, and the total number of units. And then it summarizes the total number of proposed bedrooms. So again, as you go over to the right, it also shows the number of parking spaces associated with each of those buildings and a parking ratio. And this continues down, it, you know, continuing down the chart, we've got the 55 plus active living, you know, senior housing component, uh, townhome component, the student housing component, the hotel, office, 
And then finally, a small retail component related with the town square. It also summarizes the amount of square footage related to structured parking. These are parking garages that are attached to buildings. So, you know, we, we, we want to minimize the amount of surface parking. We don't think surface parking is appropriate for this sort of walkable, um, sort of exciting sort of uh, community that we're trying to, to build here. So we're proposing a number of parking structures to make sure that we have enough parking for all the uses that we're proposing here, but we don't want to have acres and acres and acres of, uh, of, of surface parking lots, which we'll get to later in the discussion. The colors that are shown here correspond to the master plan. So if you're going to refer back to the master plan, these colors roughly correspond to the colors of the buildings on that master plan. And it, it shows the proposed uh, phasing of each of these components. So it shows which of the phases, which of the buildings we expect to be built first, and then second, third, fourth, and fifth. As we've explained before, you know, this is a big project. We don't expect it to be built all at once. It is going to be built over a number of years in a number of phases. So that attempts to show, you know, what comes first all the way through to the end. Near the bottom, it shows the, the existing Royal Crest uh, statistics. So it's got the, the existing Royal Crest square footage, the number of units at the existing Royal Crest, the total number of bedrooms that exist there today, Currently, all of the Royal Crest uh, units that exist today are two and three bedroom larger units. The number of parking spaces that exist. Um, and then finally, at the bottom of the page, it goes into some detail about the FAR. So the FAR is the floor area ratio. So that's a typical way of measuring density that compares um, the amount of floor area total in a building as it compares to the total area of the site that it's on. So it's a very, very large site, as we've talked about. It's approximately 77 acres, which translates to 3,318,000 square feet. So the existing Royal Crest is about 807,000 square feet spread out all over that, that parcel in over 55 buildings. What we are proposing in like actual, like living, working retail spaces of, of square footage is 2.5 million. And then if you add the parking structures to that, it's approximately 3.2 million. So that 3.2 million, even if you include the parking structures, the FAR is still under 1.0, which is considered a relatively low density, but that's what we're showing here. And uh, it also has for reference the, the existing uh, floor area ratio under the town's bylaw, and then you know what, what we would be requesting. So that's a quick summary of this particular sheet. What we, what, what we wanted to do is to get as much information that you guys are interested in in one place so you can all look at it together. So um, we're happy to um, answer questions about this or um, you know, um, you know, if there's other modifications, if you want more information, we're, we're happy to get it for you. Um, this is Kelly. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, this is Kelly. So I just have a question. I know I like how it's broken out that the total number of bedrooms, you know, as existing um, and what it will be with it with the proposed modifications. Is there something similar with the number of residents? So we could see because you know bedrooms are it's not a not a one for one, and you know certainly yeah how you calculate it, but just to see the number of people. Yeah, we discussed that, and it was really hard to estimate with with any specificity as far as the the actual number of residents. But you know, I think we're we're happy to go back and try to um, take another stab at that, <laughs> if you will. We we were trying to we we thought bedrooms was a pretty good way to sort of compare it, um, but you know, we can see if we can come up with a metric that would work there. We, we haven't quite come up with, with an apples to apples to, uh, way to compare it yet. 
Well, do we know how many people live there today? We do. We do. Or it's something okay, that so we, we can, can find out. Okay, so we can figure out how many live there today. Then just going through your chart, mixed into multifamily, and there are standard um, criteria used for how many bedrooms for how many people, right? Estimates yeah. normally, because we get that for the schools. Yeah. You know, if it's a two bedroom, we're at, uh, averaging, you know, you know, uh, 2.7 people or three people or whatever. It seems like we could do that for the multifamily yeah. based on the bedrooms. The 55 active, I think we, sh again, the same in the townhomes and then the yeah. student housing, is really, you know, how I mean, many beds there. there are. That's how many kids there are going to be. That's how many kids, yeah, exactly. So it seems like we can do it if you just do it that okay. way. Yeah, no, that's fine. That, I, I I agree with that methodology. We'll, uh, we'll okay. put that together and, and give it to you. We'll understand that it's an estimate and that it's yeah. not perfect. Um, but, I mean, we're going to have to have a similar type of estimate for the financial uh, impact anyway. So Yeah, understood. Yeah, we can provide that. Yeah, that will help us get to school age children as well because we need you know, we'll want right. to see that. Yep. So, well, I, can I do what? Can uh, let me. I there's one that I wanted to just go some, just put some numbers out there, and then we'll go uh, if we can. We'll go John and then Peter and then Aaron if you have anything, Kelly as well. Okay. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong. So, currently, Royal Crest is floor area ratio or the amount of space used is about 806,000 square feet. Is that right? Am I reading that right? That is correct. That's correct, yes. And the proposal is for residential aspects is uh, 2.295 million approximately. Is that right? If I add up the multi mixed income, the multifamily, the 55, the townhouse and the student, everything except for the hotel, office and town square. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so that is an increase of about 2.845 uh, times 2.845. Okay, uh, I'm not going to, that's just the numbers. Okay, yeah. Um, yep. If we look at units, we're going from 588 to 16 point, 1641, that's 2.79 times as many. So that those are actually very similar. Um, and then for bedrooms, we're going from a current 1284, I believe, to 2927, which is actually less. That's a, of a increase of 2.279, 2.28. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Okay. okay. That's correct. So just those, I think those numbers might be helpful for people. Um, yep. Is there any calculation of how much open space there currently is versus how much is proposed? That might be something that I would like to see in this chart. Yeah, there is, and we have that uh, on separate sheets, um, but I can add that here. I think that that would be beneficial to add here. Okay, great. I know you were gonna talk about open space later, but if we, I think yep. that would be helpful for this chart as well, just as a comparison. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's uh, that. I just wanted to kind of put those numbers out there because they were, I thought they were important just in kind of, um, understanding what we're talking about in terms of numbers. I think later on, we're going to have to talk about, okay, what does that mean? What does increasing floor area, uh, increasing the, you know, the space used for residential by 2.845 as proposed, what does that mean in terms of impacts? Um, but I think for now getting the numbers is important and then we can talk about the impacts. Um, so then I'll yeah. turn it over to John for questions or comments. Yeah, the, the one comment that I had, and it's basically the same thing that you did, E10, is that if I look at these numbers, it's fair to say the square footage of all the structure is approximately four times in this project what's there today. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, if you include the parking structures, and, and, and you'll note here that we didn't include any of the existing garages or surface parking that like right now all of the parking is essentially surface parking but yes if you're looking for new structures versus existing structures about four times different. okay okay that's so the 
That is four times as dense as what's there today. By one measure, yes. Okay, thanks. That's, that's the other question I had. Uh, Peter? Yeah, thanks, Aton. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, um, uh, highlight a little bit uh, some of the comments that I think both Aton and John made. Um, first, I want to say, um, uh, I think the applicant was, was quite responsive to the questions we had. Uh, I find this to be a very useful table. What I think we've asked for tonight is to add uh, two columns, two additional, one for people before and after, and one for open space before and after. But I just want to say that uh, um, I, I think what we've done is quite responsive and, and it's, it's very helpful. And I think the clarity it brings, which is a word I used the first time we met, uh, the importance of clarity of information, I think will go a long ways towards everyone's interest here. So I just want to thank you. Um, thank you. And, and I, when I kind of think about both Aton and John's comments, my interpretation is that not, or as expected, as expected, this is showing us a range of increasing density depending on the measure. And that's kind of what I expected to see, that if we look at the change in total bedrooms, it's about one a quarters times more dense. If we look at total square feet of all structures, it's about four times as dense. If we look at things like residential units, it's a little shy of triple. Now, so let's say two and a half to be fair. Um, and I think that's very, very helpful to understand that depending on how we measure, we're basically looking at two and a quarters to four times the density within the 70 acre parcel. Is that a fair way to summarize that? Yes. Okay, and again, thank you. Uh, thanks, Aton. Oh, uh, Kelly, anything you wanna to add to that just to, about this chart? No, I'm all set, thank you. Okay, and again, what I wanna say is, I actually also, I, Jack Peter's point, I really appreciate the chart. I really appreciate that it doesn't come with any kind of commentary, it's just the numbers as they are, and that we can talk about them and discuss them and their different meanings. Um, and again, I think it's important to get the numbers first and see what we're talking about. Like Peter said, you know, it's definitely more dense, and then we're going to talk about as part of our reviews, well, what does that mean for it to be more dense? Should it be more dense? How much more dense should it be? Is it taking a property that's underutilized in terms of its density and making it more appropriately? Or is it too much? And do we have to scale that back? Those are the discussions we are going to have and the impact of density in terms of if it's three times more, what is that going to mean fiscally and for traffic? Um, yeah. schools and things like that versus two and a half versus two but i don't think we can even get to those topics until we actually have these numbers so it's a great first step in enabling us to have a discussion of, of what's a what's appropriate and what we can do um, on this property um, but we needed this first so this is a great tool that we have now and hey, Tom, I, I, had, I, I had the one other item i wanted to note on this if that's okay I think you froze, Aton. I'm going to go ahead. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Sadly, you can hear me. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've talked about adding, asking you to add two columns. Yes. I'd like to ask whether or not you should add a couple rows at the bottom. And here's what I mean by that. This is very helpful uh, near the bottom where you have existing Royal Crest estates, total square footage, residential units, total bedrooms, parking spaces, parking ratio. I want to ask if there's any other existing conditions that you could add in an extra row or two. And I don't know, I'll just throw an example out. Is, you know, is, is there a number here for existing 40B square footage? Uh, you know, is there 
you know, I, and I, I'm actually not asking you to repeat the entire chart. Yeah. I, I don't know that we need the full breakdown of every category. I mean, obviously we don't need it for hotel. Uh, you know, um, and I, I think we don't need it for most, but if I, I mostly want to ask you to think about, is there uh, another one or two existing conditions that you could add in a new row or two at the bottom? I don't really know yet. Yeah. I'll, I'll just throw it to you and ask you to think about that. Yeah, I understand. We, and we will think of that. And if there's uh, things that we think would be useful for the board, we'll, we'll add it. And Peter, if it should occur to you what uh, some of those items might be, would obviously uh, follow up on that. I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of something now, but if you think of something, um, we'll, we'll put our heads together and, and see if we can do that analysis. Okay, thanks. Um, I have Gene's phone number. Okay, sure you do. Gene has an iPhone number. So. <laughs> All right, so the next follow up item I think is pertinent is a landscape presentation that somewhat informs the conversation at the last meeting related to the homes that front on Turnpike Street. And so I will read that file name. The file name is 20 underscore 1124 underscore RCE landscape buffer dot PDF. So again, Mike, if you could walk the board through that material. Sure, absolutely. So this was, uh, this was a series of diagrams that our architect, Elkis Manfredi, uh, along with our engineer and our landscape architect, uh, VHB and Copley Wolf, uh, all collaborated on which we think really, you know, helps tell the story here and hopefully is, is um, helps you guys on the board understand uh, the pro proposal a little bit better. And in, in particular, the edge conditions, which we know everybody is, is, and we are very concerned about. So what this attempts to do is to take the ma master plan. There's a, there's a sort of summary of the master plan in the lower right hand corner of the first page. And it shows the area that we're looking at as far as the study. And then on the lower left hand of the page, it shows um, some specific, it shows a, a, a zoomed in version of, of um, the area that we're looking at. And it shows the distance of, it shows essentially the extent of the buffers that we're proposing and the distance from the buildings that we are proposing to the nearest you know, single family houses in particular. Let's say that that's, that's what we're most concerned about. We don't want to overwhelm or negatively impact the single family houses. So uh, on the top of that sheet, it, it shows essentially a section which shows the different heights of our proposed buildings, shows the heights, approximate heights of the trees in the buffer, and then it shows the heights and the distances to the single family houses. On the next page, it has um, an aerial view showing that same extent of condition. So it shows the buffer, it shows our property line with the abutters, and it shows the proposed buildings and their distance to the closest house. So um, on the second, on page two of this, this particular file, it shows the buildings proposed for the student housing that front onto uh, Route 114, this is actually the closest that we have a building that comes to an abutting single family house. This house is on Route 114 at uh, 322 Turnpike Street. You can see that the buffer approximately is 110 feet. So the proposed four story building there is 110 feet away from the house. And the five story section of that particular building as we propose it is 270 feet from that house. The next page. Mike, Mike, if I could just interrupt for a second again, just to yeah. remind the board, the discussion at the November 5th meeting was related to this property actually is triangular shaped. And so from the end of the property line, which comes to a point closest to the storm building, if I remember correct, is it's like a 23 set setback to the property line, but you're highlighting the fact building to building, it's much broader. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the next page shows um, a typical condition on Berkeley Road. So um, essentially at, at this location, the closest proposed building that we have 
is a th is a three story townhouse style building. So these are relatively short, relatively in the same context as the single family houses, just closer together. Um, but the closest that the, that the closest house to these proposed buildings is 198 feet away. And again, the next page after this shows uh, an aerial view showing the very you know substantial mature trees. You know the vast vast majority of those are going to remain as they're shown here, and then the new buildings that we propose in the distance to the nearest single family house. The next page, again, um, this, this is addressing the condition uh, to the south. Um, uh, essentially, where our property abuts Hillside, um, Hillside Road, there's a very significant buffer here. There's an existing wetland area that um, is partially on our property and partially on the abutting properties. But in this location, we wanted to show what, what the possible um, impacts are. So it shows that the distance from a proposed parking garage in um, at the far southern site of, of our proposed master plan is 280 feet, approximately 280 feet from the nearest single family house. And the, the nearest uh, taller building, which is four stories, is 460 feet away. And again, we're maintaining a very strong and wide um, mature treed buffer um, from our buildings to our property line. And the net last page, the last page right. shows, uh, shows that from an aerial view as well. Just to clarify, those are all deciduous trees, correct? They are not all deciduous trees. I know that there's a large number of pine trees, um, but there, you know, there's a large, there's a, there's there's a fair number for sure of of deciduous trees. You know, one thing that we have just just to just to jump on that because just just to let you know, as recently as today, we've talked about um, you know doing a, a study with an arborist to get a better indication of the exact conditions of the trees on site. Um, as we develop our landscape plans, but that's something that we are going to be working on. So we, we will have more information about the exact makeup of the trees. I mean, here's here's the too. problem with, with what you've done with that picture. Uh, first of all, you've shown it as a fully bloom tree canopy, which we know isn't going to exist for six months a year. Secondly, what you've done is you've, you've drawn the uh, the trees up literally to the next of the building. And you know you're going to have to clear like at least 25 feet around the buildings from that. So you lose the buffer on the building side. Yeah, that's a fair comment. I think that they they uh, probably could use some clarifications in in that we, particular respect as you we, get we right cannot, up. We, can, we can uh, trim a few trees for sure. The, the main point being made here is the distances that's and right. Buildings and, and houses. We could do probably the same thing of showing uh, a different time of year. So but what distance? 280. Uh, how close is that building to the property line? Uh, that is not in this particular diagram. I do have that in a different diagram, which I can pull up if you'd like. Well, just I, I, I mean, is it is it more than 100? It is more than 100 and in most locations I can say and and actually in my next presentation it has some plans that speak to this it's it's on average it's 140 feet from our proposed buildings to the property line. Okay. Mike is there any reason you didn't include I'll call it the northwest quadrant so the distance from that corner to Quail Run property which is probably the narrowest existing today to a building. The only uh, the only reason we didn't is because we thought that the impact there was relatively minor and that we um, because we don't have any tall buildings in that entire part of our of our proposed master plan. The, the highest the highest height that we have there is a three story townhouse. Um, we also have some other images which I actually have in the next presentation that or take a view from Quail Run from that from that area, which you know I can point out. 
Um, but we can, we, we're, we're happy to do this similar exercise, taking right, into Mike, let, me, let me jump in here because in answering uh, some questions that we've been getting, um, Mike assigned me the task of uh, following up with some of this information. With respect to quail run, the closest uh, existing Royal Press building to the closest quail run residence right now is 110 feet. Under the master plan, it's going to be 194 feet. Yeah. If uh, that sheds some light on why we're we're pretty confident we're we're a good distance away. And as you know, we've been meeting with folks from Quail Run. Do we have uh, this is Aton? Do we have any actual live photos of the trees and the? Uh, views currently i mean i i was going to make a similar comment to john is that these the, the the pictures we have here are helpful for distances but they look like they've been these buildings have been plopped right down in the middle of trees that don't either don't really exist or aren't going to be in bloom like this um or some might have to be removed do we have actual photos of what the tree coverage looks like because i know i drove by today and a bunch of the trees there are a bunch of trees out front and this is just on turnpike streets so of some of the different area but a lot of them are bare some aren't um but do we have actual photo i don't remember seeing any actual current royal crest tree coverage photos maybe um, i missed it we do in in sort of our main presentation we do have some existing photos um you know i think that so we they they do exist we've got them i think that they're in your packet but they're they're it's a ways back so i could potentially pull those up or actually team would have to pull those up but that is, you know that is something that you know we're happy to do some additional work on to take some existing condition photos show the condition right now would be a good time to do it because this would be essentially the if you will the worst time as far as the existing trees so we're happy to do that and we can we can circle back with you on that yeah or even that would be helpful even some extras or just tell us where they are but i think that would be helpful in looking at this and seeing yeah. what potential view corridors are going to be yeah at the Understood. worst time, like you said. Yeah. Okay, Jean. All right, Mike, do you want to speak to the revised buffer and height diagram? So that's the one on the November 5th meeting I didn't have in the packet and you thought it was worth including tonight. Yeah, the only um the only thing that 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 changed in that particular uh presentation was it showed the average existing buffer versus the proposed um the, pro the proposed average buffer so again okay. as jim essentially just mentioned the existing buffer is approximately 100 110 feet and the proposed buffer is 140 feet so uh, our almost our, around the entire perimeter of our site we're proposing a wider buffer between the buildings that we will be building uh, versus uh, the buildings that exist there today so just to reiterate for the public, the file that we're referring to is file name 2011-05 REVRC buffer and height diagrams. So one point of clarification, in a lot of spots, particularly on the Hillside Road site, you have sort of wetlands there. But yes. The stuff is in blue. And so that implies it's a pond. Are those, do we have real ponds? I mean, by what anybody would call a pond or is it just vegetated wetlands that have those, things growing in them? Those are typically vegetated wetlands. You know, some of them are wetter than other others, but those are technically wetlands. They're not technically ponds. So you're not gonna have like a little pond or a lake there. It's, it's, it's a wetland. It's a wetland and you know in the next presentation that we'll get to we'll show you some of our thinking as far as landscape design and amenities and how that interacts with the wetlands. Um, and what we're thinking, um, but um, for the, the majority of those are not not really ponds they are they're vegetated wetlands but but obviously we have to protect them and we are proposing to protect them. Okay.
All right, and so the last housekeeping item is a couple of a butter comments that I just wanna make sure the board's aware of and did get a chance to read them. One of them is from a business owner named John McGarry. He owns the property immediately to the right facing Rural Crest. And so there's two buildings on one parcel of land. He wrote a letter essentially to Mass DOT with concerns about their proposed roadway improvement. The, the main Rural Crest entrance intersection actually has been shifted nearer his property and he's concerned about the safety of left-hand turns into his parcel. Um, and so I, he copied me on that, so I included it in the packet. In addition, there was an abutter comment submitted for the last meeting from a shawman on Hillside Road. Um, and she has had a meeting, I believe her and her husband with yes. Trinity. Yes. Um, and so she has provided a meeting summary as well as Trinity has provided a meeting summary of that meeting. And there's a couple of points. I, first, I'll defer to the board to see if they have any questions, but I do have a couple of comments, not necessarily questions related to the responses. So Aton, if you want the board to respond first, or if you want me to give my comments, whatever you prefer. Why don't you give your comments and then if there, we can talk about those if, if as needed and then anything additional. Okay, um, it's come up a few times, well, I guess many times in terms of the existing zoning for Rural Crest being a 0.75 FAR is allowed. But I think what hasn't been conveyed properly and I don't think this abutter walked away with a sense of really a comprehensive zoning analysis. And so as, as far as the FAR, it is allowed as 0.75 in the residential five zoning district. However, there's several other zoning components that kind of handcuff that FAR. And the fact that Rural Crest exists at 0.24 is primarily attributed to R5 only allows for a max height of 40 feet. It only allows for a max of three stories. It only allows for 18 units per structure. And so that kind of tells the story as to why they're spaced the way they are, why they're located the way they, the way they are, why the heights are the way they are. And so although a 0.75 is allowed, I'm not so sure it's achievable given the other limitations within the zoning district. And again, I'm, I'm hoping this abutter is reading that because her kind of takeaway in her summary was, they contend the parcel is currently underutilized given the property value, FAR metric of density will be less than one and allowable under town zoning. And that's been said many times tonight as well. And so I just wanted to provide some context to that. And in summary, at the end of her response, her sentence, I'll read it, they implied that the less sensitive, denser development would be possible if this development does not happen. And again, I'm just not sure that that is accurate given the other limitations within zoning for this parcel. And then as far as Trinity's response, there's just a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, and again, one of the responses is that this is allowable per town zoning code. And again, the reason that we're all here and I think everybody's putting in some real good time and effort to really evaluate this proposal. But the fact of the matter was we're here because zoning doesn't allow this proposal. And we are, we are actively working with a working group to try to craft some zoning that um, you know, people have an appetite for. And there's somewhat of a subjective clause, which 1.0 FAR is a very low density. And I'm sure from a developer's point of view, that may be the case, but I, I would just point that's somewhat subjective. Um, and then there's a comment, and again, I'd look to, to, to Trinity to, to provide some information on this because I'd love to know where they are, but there was a question as whether there's any other building heights like this in town and the response are there are there are there are any others in, in town and the response is we believe there are a few but not many if so are they near residential areas nearby but not directly abutting and i've been asked this question from some board members and the only building i can come up with that is approximately 70, 70 feet in height is in our historic mill district and yes. it's former location of a converse headquarters type building um it's office space it's somewhat proximate to the residential area. As you know, Avalon is going immediately abutting this, this particular yes. building. But are you aware of other five-story buildings in town that abut residential that, districts? That was the one that we identified. And there's, there's another building that appears to be five stories that looks like it's residential on the other side of where Avalon is proposed. But I don't know the specifics about that. But okay. it does appear to be five stories. 
Okay. So the only That's other fair. comment I have in that response is those questions asked about Merrimack College and who will own the property dedicated to Merrimack. The response is Merrimack or a nonprofit entity associated with Merrimack will own it. Will the property pay taxes to the town? The response is no. And then they get into who will residents call? And the, the response is they'll call campus security of Merrimack. And I don't envision, and this isn't a decision for myself or I imagine the planning board to make, but I don't think we're gonna be advising residents to call campus security. Uh, and again, I don't think that's for our discussion and I don't think it's our authority, but it struck me that I don't know how exactly Andover works, but I'm not sure that that is a proper response. Again, I just wanted to point it out to the board as um, you know, residents calling campus security for and I, in the neighborhood. And a clarification of that is that we didn't think that residents would call campus security, that campus security would be referred to respond to say noise complaints or stuff like that at that particular building. We do expect that Merrimack's campus security will be the sort of patrolling entity of that particular building, just like the buildings that are on their site. Okay, so just for clarity for the, for the again, the public, because this is an ongoing issue in Andover, and there's an article in Andover today's Tribune about students in residential neighborhoods that are about them. So it yep. says, who will neighbors on adjacent properties, townhome residents, and students call when they when issues of safety, fire, noise, underage drinking occur in that area. So I took that to mean in the general area of the neighborhood and the yeah. response is campus security. And again, not my decision, so, but I don't think that is where the town would land on that answer. So. Yeah, and we will absolutely clarify that. That okay. is, um, that is an, uh, that, that, that's something that we'll work, we'll, we'll work more on to make sure that everybody is satisfied <laughs> on that particular topic. So, um, Gene, on that topic, I think that one, I do think it is a fair question for us to ask because part of this proposal is Merrimack owning and managing that area. And that's, I think, so I think everything associated with that is really fair. So two things on that. One, I'd like some information from the town. I mean, I actually think it's a town responsibility to get the planning board as well as residents that information of what is the current, what is the current rules for Merrimack and for a proposed Merrimack building off their um, of current campus, uh, is there a memorandum of understanding between North Andover, North Andover Police Department and Merrimack about who handles calls, who handles what types of calls, things like that, who, I, I, I know when I worked in Beverly, there was a memorandum between Beverly Police and Endicott Police if someone was arrested did what would happen there should be rules and regulations regarding that even outside of this so yeah. i'd like to get from our own people some answers on that and then uh, at a future time when we discuss financial impacts and um the any uh, other uh, arrangements i do think it needs to be talked about you know how if merrimack owns this building and manages it or a nonprofit owns it and we're not getting any tax value from that is there going to be some sort of pilot in place is there going to be some sort of other agreement um, because that's clearly going to have an impact on the fiscal impact study and you know what we see from tax revenue and things like that so i think that's important yeah. and so we'll need some answers down the line when we get into the fiscal impacts on that mr chair would it be appropriate if i commented on this or do you want to um no, go ahead. So the starting point, as we all know, at Royal Crest is you have students intermingled with um, uh, families and others, and um, it's a mixture that uh, we can all uh, imagine and does not work out well. It's our understanding that the Merrimack campus security does not have jurisdiction at, at Royal Crest, and therefore any kind of nuisance call goes to the, uh, the North Andover PD. In the fiscal study, uh, there has been uh, uh, meetings with uh, the, the police department to try to assess uh, what the impact of the new Royal Crest would be. But in terms of Merrimack, they are assuming responsibility for uh, this property, and they will be resp primarily responsible for managing it and making sure that um, the kinds of things that we're 
have observed uh, previously at Royal Crest don't happen. But anything involving life safety, fire, or anything like that would, would definitely fall back on the town. It's just that I think the, the, the point we're trying to make is the fiscal study will evaluate what the uh, impacts are and capture whatever residual costs there are. But Merrimack is going to assume responsibility for the proper management of this property. Uh, okay, um, but to be fair, you can't always contain problems on one property. So if, if someone's in a dorm and intoxicated and then is now wandering around the retail area, that becomes a North Andover Police Department yep. problem because Merrimack doesn't have jurisdiction there. Um, so there really should be, uh, if there isn't, and there may already be um, agreements or rules or memorandums of understanding between Merrimack and North Andover about what happens in situations, uh, what happens in you know serious uh, sexual assault type situations. There, there needs to be rules uh, of allegations, things like that, or uh, thefts or you know, serious crimes, things like that, or even just noise complaints. But if it's people outside the property, they need to know who to call and when uh, and how that's going to be worked out. So. But I think that's more, I don't think that's, to be honest, I don't necessarily think that's on you. I think that's on um, our town and police and Merrimack to yes. provide, to make those arrangements and provide us that information. But from you guys, we will need to know about the fiscal impact of if certain properties are not on the tax rolls, how are we going to account for that? Because Sorry. I, I think that's, an, as Merrimack increases their, uh, share a property in town and um, they do so I find in a really structured and smart manner we're still losing money off the tax rolls and I think at some point that really needs to be addressed well what we we um, as you know we've been anxious to get the fiscal study out but now it's it's in effect being processed almost as if the peer review is taking place now Great. Um, but we are uh, confident that the uh, the overall contribution to the town, the net revenue that's going to be generated, this will take into account the fact that the uh, Merrimack parcel will not be generating um, property taxes. Don't want to rule out a pilot or something like that. And certainly don't want to rule out a very appropriate agreement between the uh, North Andover Police and, and Merrimack regarding uh, all of these other issues. But uh, we think we. we, we, we with Merrimack's support in this, that we, we believe we'll get to a good place. Okay, that those are my comments. Uh, others, Peter? Yeah, um, James, a very helpful converse, uh, the, a discussion about Merrimack, which has uh, uh, helped me think of an idea that you asked for any ideas about adding lines on the bottom of the density chart or table. And it might be helpful to have an extra line that shows the current number of Merrimack students. Yep. And I also, uh, this is going to sound kind of weird, uh, a line showing nothing. And what I mean by that is maybe we add a line showing 40B, showing that there aren't any. And yep. that would be helpful to people to understand, OK, that's a change. And it just helps us understand the change. Yep. All right, thank you. Actually, can I, I, I want to piggyback on that. Gene, can we get something at some point from planning or from the town that if these proposed numbers for 40B were implemented, what that would mean for our 40B numbers and percentages and things like that? Because I think that's important. I don't think it necessarily belongs on this chart, but just a separate chart that, okay, if this number of units was added, what does that actually uh, do for us in terms of our 40B uh, projections. That would be helpful. Yeah, I have a back of an envelope. I'll have to revisit it, but I'll get you something. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anyone else uh, comments? We'll go down the line. John? No, I'm good. Aaron? Yeah, just uh, getting back to um, open space buffering, um, you know, anecdotally, I ran through you know, on Quail Run about a week or so ago and uh, saw the very close existing structure, uh, you know, just 
you know, looking to the left as I was running by and, and seeing the very close um, uh, Royal Crest structure and practically in somebody's backyard, but also a lot of bare trees and I could see parking lots beyond. So I'm still very concerned about the level of buffering on that side. Um, and also up on Turnpike Street, uh, where we have these three residences, um, and specifically one that would be very close to a proposed dorm. Um, I just don't think that level of buffering is is going to work. But uh, and I, I and I think it should be the the level of buffering that would be around the 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 what is proposed for the rest of the property or the rest of the development, I should say. But uh, but I think a, a a field trip is in order to really see if that would be the case. And I didn't know if there was an appetite for this group to actually see each other on site. I know six feet apart and all uh, to actually look at what is there now, um, look at the types of trees that are there, um, look at what kind of buffering would be, uh, try to assess to the best of our ability where certain buildings might be um, at least in some key spots like this one along turnpike street um, to just get a, a little bit better understanding of the current condition Um, I don't know if you're asking the developer if we're willing to lead a delegation on the property. I think the answer to that is yes. I'm not we're sure happy. everybody else wants to go. <laughs> they happen to do it. Yeah, um, asking the most. So I think the question was whether or not a site visit is appropriate. Uh, I, I don't know if we're there yet. Um, I got to think about that one. I don't know what other people think. I'm not. To me, I'm not sure we're there yet. Even though I do want to see what it looks like currently, I'm just not sure. I think we may want to have further developed plans. I think it's like visit at some point, but with COVID restrictions as well, I'm not sure it's the right time. But I think, you know, you know, that being said, um, I, I, I think there's real issues, especially with this turnpike street uh, buffering uh, next to the dorms. And I, I would, I would suggest that uh, Trinity maybe try a scenario B where they get the dormitory, yet they also get the buffer. I'm not sure what the solution is there. Yeah. And to be okay. sure, we've we've reached out to uh, those three uh, property owners and we have not heard back anything. I don't know, Jean, have you heard anything from them? No, the only one that had contacted me a couple years ago when you first brought this to the Board of Selectmen and the Planner Board, um, has since sold that property. So I was able to contact, contact him, but he's no longer in that building. He was the middle one, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, I would say though, if people want to go out there now to kind of see current conditions, rather than maybe waiting till dead of winter or early spring, um, that they maybe contact Gene and one or two of us can certainly go out at any time, not have any open meeting law. And I'm sure meet up with, you know, someone on site to kind of walk around. I think that wouldn't be a problem, but I do want to have, further on in the process an official site visit um, but I'm hoping it's further along and maybe when members of the public have a better opportunity to view it as well. Then I had one more thing just uh, regarding um, our schedule. I know that we were supposed to be uh, see, or at least if our, our, our thoughts as the planning board and Gene put together the, the a schedule that we, we thought we should be seeing a fiscal impact analysis. And I know that's in the works, being reviewed, but I'm just con getting concerned that schedule-wise that um, that this planning board might be pushed up against it um, in a month or two um, because we're get, getting a little bit off schedule. Yeah. We're we're in agreement with you that we want to get that get that out there as as quickly as possible. We're working very closely with the town um, to get the the fiscal impact study completed, peer, you know, to an extent peer reviewed and out to yourselves as well as to others, the select board, um, so that 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 the impacts can be assessed. So I and Aaron, I so I would say this is a Jenningen. I would say that I agree with your point. 
I think we keep moving forward as we are. I think we're getting responses as quickly as we can and as thoroughly as we can. And I also appreciate that the applicants are meeting with people that have comments and questions. Um, so we keep moving forward, but at the same time, know that if it's not ready come town meeting time or when we need yep. it to be ready, then it's not ready. If it is ready, great. Um, but, you know, I think we just keep going. But I think I agree in the back of my mind right now, I'm saying I'm not sure what the timelines are going to be, but I'm not ready to write it off or to say that it's a go either. I think we just keep going because we're getting good information. We're making progress, but it's, you know, the working group still has a lot of work to do and we still have a lot of work to do. So I think we all just have to kind of recognize that and keep moving forward. And as we move closer to next year and the spring, we'll make decisions as to where we stand. So, uh, Kelly, anything additional at this point? Nothing additional. Okay, so now are we ready to kind of talk about open space? All yes. Right, why don't we do that? Yeah. Uh, if, if we could, um, it, it may be beneficial to just do a very brief overview of our outreach process and what we've done and where we're going. It should just take a few minutes. I think um, it'd be good sure. to give you guys an update on that. Sure. So, Gene, I don't know if you want to refer to the document um, that uh, we submitted, as well as the uh, the preview of the website. So I'm going to bring up the the second document you submitted. So one was a very brief narrative, and the other one. One second. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we're looking at a document entitled Outreach Plan. Is that no. right? No. Yeah. The file name is 2011-30 Rural Crest Communication Plan 11.30.pdf. So yeah, okay, we thought that... we just... Go ahead. Oh, is, is that the one we want to look at? There's another document in the... That says 2011-25 new Royal Crest Outreach Plan. I just want to make sure we're looking at the. That's a fairly brief high-level narrative. Okay. This one came in today, and it's a little bit more substantive. Right. Okay, great. So we're looking at 2011-30 Royal Crest Communication Plan 11.30. Yeah. So we just wanted to give you uh, and the board a you know brief overview of what we've been doing, what we plan to do. Uh, we know and we've heard that it's incredibly important that we get out and make sure that everybody in town that wants to know about this project and should know about it does know about it. So we've heard that loud and clear. We've really spent a lot of time sort of building up our team to make sure that we are reaching everybody that, that needs to be reached um, and that we're doing it in, you know, a number of different ways so that, you know, especially today, when it's a lot harder to go knock on doors that we're still getting um, getting out to talk to people, hearing their concerns, hearing their questions, responding to them, and ultimately having them be a part of this process. You guys are just one part of it. So um, to that end, we have been, um, you know, just to start things off, we've been notifying and we've been letting all of the existing Royal Crest residents know about this process and what we're going through and um, you know, working with them. We've been having individual meetings with families. All of them have been virtual at this point. Um, it's the most appropriate way to do it, but we've had individual meetings with families that live in the neighborhoods directly abutting the property. We expect to continue that in the next couple of weeks and do even more and and um do some more group meetings so that we can reach people who might not want to you know meet individually but might be more comfortable in a group meeting so we're, we're talking about getting those organized and trying to get uh, again get the word out as as much as possible especially to um to the people you know directly not not necessarily directly abutting the property we want to reach those people but the people in the neighborhoods abutting the property. And then beyond that, you know, anybody in town who's interested. 
Um, we've been meeting with commercial property owners directly abutting the property. We have met and I've spoken many times with uh, John McGarry who did communicate with the board um, as well as others. We are in very, very frequent communication with Merrimack College as you can expect. Um, we've obviously been meeting frequently with you guys and we plan to meet uh, frequently with the select board as well as with the Conservation Commission as we move into the ne next couple of months. And we also have given a presentation to the town's affordable housing committee and, and taken some of their comments and questions and uh, some other select groups. Uh, one of the big things that we're very excited about and we think is really gonna help the process is we are just about ready to launch a new website that will have um, all of the project information, it'll have the plans, it'll have figures that you guys have seen, it'll have schedule updates and milestones, um, and most importantly, it'll have a real-time comment and feedback section so that people can leave a comment, they can see what other people are commenting, and you know, hopefully we can, we can interact with people in that way. We expect to launch that next week. Uh, Gene, I don't know if you could pull up just briefly the overview plan just so people can see um, the, the preview of that. So this is entitled, oh, you go ahead, Jean. I'm, I'm sorry, but you can see my screen, right? You can see your screen, yes. Okay, so it, it is entitled Outreach Website dash ruralcrestdevelopment.pdf. Yes, so uh, again, this is a website that will be open to everybody. We're gonna be trying to, and expecting to spread this, the, the, the information, the link for this site very widely so people can see it. As we develop more diagrams and more information and share it with you guys, we're gonna share it on the website so anybody can get to it. And this isn't meant to replace anything that you guys or the town are doing. It's just meant to augment that and be a place for people who, again, it's got this real-time comment section, which we're pretty excited about. So um, again, we're, we're previewing this with people this week and next week we expect this to go live. And um, I'm gonna introduce another member of our team, Greg Lane, who is um, again, augmenting our capacity and helping us get, um, get out before the community. And he's gonna talk about what we expect to do uh, over the coming couple of months to make sure that the people really are hearing about it and we get their comments. So Greg, I don't know if you can jump in. Yes, I can jump in, Mike. Thank you very much. And uh, happy holidays, everybody. I can't believe we're in December. Um, as Chair said, time time is going to fly, and we've got a, um, a lot of work ahead of us. I know that the, uh, the Royal Crest AMCO team has invested a lot of time and effort, as well as the planning board and staff, you know, just listening to the conversation you all have had um, you know it's obvious there's a a lot of work that's going into this project and now it's up to uh, myself and I'm going to be out in the community with uh, I've got a, a, a team behind me including uh, Brian Mills and Jonathan Ginsberg who are going to be two of the key people working with me who you may hear their names uh, bantered about in the community um, you know we're going to try to take all the discussion here and synthesize and boil it down and get it out into the community as mike said so folks have the information it's accessible it's easy to um, interact with the website is really more of a, a portal um, it's really an exciting um, tool to use for for the residents because not only can they ask questions but we're going to interact you know, we're going to generate the conversation taking information from meetings like this and bringing it out to the community and posing questions and gathering feedback. And hopefully all this information um, gets brought back to the planning board and other committees in town to help uh, inform uh, the decision moving forward. So that's really sort of the approach that we're taking with this is uh, really trying to generate a little bit more of a discussion and dialogue out in the community. And as, as Mike said, Mike and Jim have been doing that as well as managing the project and responding to uh, you guys and working with the technical team. Um, they're going to continue to do that. We're going to be behind them and next to them trying to make sure that we reach everybody. 
and it, you know our first uh, group that we really want to make sure that we reach are the neighbors and that's everybody from you know Chestnut Street and Hillside and Berkeley then over by Franklin by the school and all the parents who send their kids to that school we want to make sure that we reach all those folks and as we all know um, because of the pandemic it's more difficult to do that uh, in person but the direct conversations are going to be critical I mean, this is a you know, a big project for the town. So we want to make sure that we're doing as much in person and we're going to utilize, you know, meet Zoom and other uh, online digital platforms to be able to communicate one-on-one -on -one with folks and in small groups, as Mike said. Uh, we're going to start by, um, get, in order to get people on to a meeting like this, they got to be aware that the meeting's happening. So we're going to start by sending out a postcard um, to the neighborhoods and we have a sort of a series going out for the next um, December and we're going you know, to probably take a little bit of a break around the holidays. Uh, people are let them enjoy their holidays and celebrate and we'll pick it back up after the new year but we hope to get a, a few in before everyone breaks for Christmas and Hanukkah and the other holidays and um, we'll hopefully be able to provide you also some, some initial feedback from those meetings. And so we'll, we'll roll out a postcard, you know, that's getting something in the mail isn't, you know, enough these days. We're gonna follow up that postcard with, uh, with an email, follow that up with a phone call, um, just as if, you know, you were at home and, you know, someone running for office or uh, an important cause happening in town, important, you know, community event was happening. You've got to touch people two or three times to make sure that they're aware. So we, we really don't want anybody in the in the abutting neighborhoods to say that they weren't aware of the, the project. Not because that would be the worst thing, but we want, as, as Mike said, we want everyone in the community that would like to participate in this process to be able to uh, get information and provide feedback. So, so we're going to do that initially in these smaller groups. At the same time, we want to make sure that the broader community is aware of this. So we're going to be working uh, with the newspapers and other platforms to make sure that the community, broader community, whether you know, no matter where you live in town, have an opportunity to participate early. As you know, as we all said, this is you know we're still early enough in the pro where this um, it can provide some valuable feedback. So we'll be doing that through you know, using the public access TV using radio uh, and uh, the newspapers to reach that broader audience. But uh, for the time being, I think probably a majority of our time is gonna be spent in, uh, in close proximity to the project. Yep. So uh, this is this is Aton. I, just, I, I, I love how much you're doing with the neighbors and I think that's really important, but I would just remind the applicant that ultimately any proposal has to go to town meeting and those are not necessarily the people that voted are going to be voting at town meeting some of them may be some yeah. of them may not be but you really need to make sure to hit the town as a whole because if you come to town meeting and half the people are saying wow this is a huge project i can't believe i haven't heard of it um you're going to be in a hole from the start um and yeah. if people have questions or comments so you really and i don't know if the best especially with covid related stuff because you normally i would say do a you know rent out a, a room at a couple of different places at town you know every two weeks and have people in and stuff like that have open houses that's going to be more difficult so you're maybe more limited to social media and and and, and mailers and phone calls and stuff like that but just don't forget ultimately how the process has to play out in spending all time you should spend a lot of time with the neighbors yeah. the neighborhoods people directly about it neighborhoods are budding which might be affected by increased traffic things like that but ultimately you know some of the items that we've talked about in terms of fiscal impact school impact traffic impact that affects everybody in town right um and everybody in town has a vote on it um so just don't just don't forget that that's all yeah
So we're, we don't plan we're, accordingly. We are in, we are in complete agreement, and uh, we we certainly you know we 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 care very much about our neighbors, and we want to make sure that they definitely know. But we also care about everybody in town, and. Again, we're in complete agreement with you and we're gonna, again, spread that word as wide as possible. We don't want anybody to be surprised about this. We want everybody in town, you know, whether you just drive by the site on a regular basis or you work at Merrimack, or, but live on the other side of town, whatever, we wanna make sure everybody knows about it as soon as possible. And that again, they have as much information as they can get. Hey, good. Peter? Yep. Thank you, yeah. So um, I also was very pleased to hear what Greg was describing about the extent of reaching out, not just to direct the butters, but to surrounding neighborhoods, listing all of the streets. I thought that was very encouraging. And I also agree with Aton that that's not enough. Um, I, I also maybe want to be a little bit pointed here. Um, how many residents outside of Royal Crest have you spoken to so far? We've, spec we've spoken to 10 families so far. So um, I have to tell you, uh, I think you're way behind and your messaging is that you've been speaking to the state DOT for what, two years, three years? You've About been three years, that's right. You've been speaking to the town for how long? And you've spoken to 10 families. So, you know, I come from a maritime background and, uh, you know, when things are really bad, you say you're in extremis. And uh, I think you've got a lot of work to do. I, I have to say I'm shocked. I'm, I, I'm not going to beat the horse too much more here, but I, I am shocked. Um, you have really got your work cut out and now it's winter. It's a pandemic. And um, I, I couldn't agree more with what Eitan said. Um, and I'm just being candid with you. And I have one other comment. <clears throat> I'm glad that you've got a, uh, a brochure to help get your message out. You have one large graphic repeated twice. Um, that's a terrible representation of the project in your selection of the graphic. I think it's misleading. Now, look, I could try to make my comments more polite, but I'm really giving you the benefit of the doubt by being as direct and candid. And there's that word again, clarity, uh, with my uh, observation here. Um, we, we just went through a, a multi-column table that I think we agreed um, is a fair representation that depending on how you measure it, the density is going to increase somewhere between two and a quarter and four times, depending on how you measure it. That is not what your principal graphic communicates. Your principal graphic repeated twice over the course of uh, two pages. Um, look, if, if you can you know, claw your way back from setting that impression, fine. But now you have winter, short of time, pandemic, and what I would characterize as a misrepresentation in your major graphic times too. So I think you do have your work cut out for you. Thanks, Aton. Appreciate the comments. All right, any other comments about the outreach? Okay, so let's right. move on. Oh, good, John. Or Aaron? No, that was, that was me. That was Mike. I was just oh, okay. ready to go. Sorry, Mike. All right, so let's move on to open space then. Okay, Gene, if you could pull up the presentation. Right, so you should see my screen now. The file name is called 201201 Presentation Open Space and Recreation 11.27.20 PowerPoint. Okay. Jimmy, if you could go to the uh, presentation or the slideshow.
So I think if you go, if you go to the slide, I think. Um, I'm not sure on, on Google. Yeah, either way, I guess you could just do it through here. It doesn't present as as well this way. I'm not sure through Google Docs how to do the slideshow. I'll figure it out. You go ahead, Mike. Okay. So this, you know, again, we're just going to quickly go through this. I know that's getting late, but we did want to, you know, touch on open space and recreation, and we do know that that's a that's a very important topic. So um, if you could go to there, we go. So if you could go to and 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 for this particular presentation, we think that this is an appropriate graphic. But uh, but Peter, your your uh, your comment was very well taken. We we understand that. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. So this is just a, an overview of the master plan, which you guys have all seen. Um, this is you know a more architectural rendered uh, master plan. But what we're going to talk about primarily here today is what we're calling uh, the New Town Green, which is a new public park that sort of frames the entranceway into our, our site and lines up with the Merrimack campus. Uh, the wide buffer around the perimeter of the site, which we've talked about, and the preservation of the wetlands around the perimeter as well, which again helps to reinforce that wide buffer. You can go to the next slide. So uh, indicated in red here is what we're calling the Newtown Green. This is a, a over two acre public park space that we expect to be um, very vibrant, actually. We expect this to be a really nice place for people who live at the site here, who might be visiting the site to shop in, in the retail establishments that we expect to be here or that might work here, or, or work at Merrimack, come across to the site here for, for a cup of coffee. Um, but this is expected to be a very nice uh, open space, open to all. Uh, around the, the, the perimeter of the town green, we have uh, the hotel, the, the proposed boutique hotel, which is the purple building just to the uh, east, I guess, on this particular drawing. Um, the blue building is the student housing, and the orange building is a new mixed-use uh, multifamily building. All of those buildings are envisioned to have retail on the first floor. So again, we want to activate this space. We don't want it to be empty. We want people to actually use it. We can go to the next. So here's an aerial rendering of, of that space. Again, on the left, it shows um, the new boutique hotel, which we're envisioning would be in sort of a contemporary New England style um, with some you know, historic elements. Uh, there's a new pavilion that you know, would potentially have a, a cafe or some other sort of activating retail usage, a wide open green space. Again, we expect uh, this uh, to be a good place for people in town and people who live here uh, to enjoy. You can go to the next slide. So this is a, you know, what we think is a very representative image of what we're proposing here. This is an image that shows the town green element on the left. This is one of the new mixed use uh, multifamily buildings that we are proposing that fronts right onto Route 114. Again, today, Route 114 is not very inviting. It's certainly not pedestrian friendly, but the work that uh, MassDOT and the town and us and others have really worked on um, to improve Route 114, we expect to take place here. So it'll be a much more inviting place um, for pedestrians, it'll be safer. Um, we actually will have a pretty wide setback from the, the edge of the road to where our buildings will be. It's approximately 25 feet, so it's not, it's not right up on the road, but we do think it's pretty appropriate for the scale of buildings that we're talking about here um, to, again, make for a pedestrian-friendly environment. And again, that's really one of the operative things that we're working on here is to make it friendly for pedestrians. We, we want it, right now, it's, it's really an automobile-oriented area. Royal Crest today has almost no sidewalks that exist there today, almost none. So, um, you know, we want it to be a nice place for people to enjoy outside. Uh, next, next slide. 
So beyond the town green, we have a number of uh, pocket parks that we're proposing. So we indicate four of them. Um, these are, you know, places that are a little bit smaller in scale, a little bit more intimate. Uh, generally, they are open to the public, but generally for the people who live around them, and we expect them, again, to be pretty active, um, you know, nice green spaces for people to enjoy. But mostly, you know, people from, from outside of the community might use them, but generally a little bit more uh, for the community. You can go to the next slide, Jean. And again, as we've been talking about a lot, you know, we want to preserve this landscaped buffer around the perimeter of the site. So that's really important, something we've spent a lot of time on. Um, one of the statistics, and this is something that maybe I'll add to the chart that we were talking about earlier, the existing buffer from Royal Crest today is about nine and a half acres. What we are proposing here is about 14 and a half. So we're actually increasing the land area from the buildings to the property line um, pretty significantly. And what that does is it, you know, it preserves the green space that we've got on the site and actually adds to it. It keeps the buildings further away from the surrounding neighborhoods and the single family houses, and it preserves those wetlands on the perimeter as well. Virginia, you can go to the next, uh, next slide. So one of the other primary elements, uh, go back one, please. So one of the primary elements that we've uh, really been excited about is the introduction of a new walking and biking path on the perimeter of the site towards the rear. Again, um, you know, 114 hasn't always been a very uh, inviting place. We expect it to be more inviting once, once we do our work and Mass DOT does theirs. But we also want to make, um, you know, something available to people to walk and bike on at the rear of the site. Um, and this is about th this this um, this path is almost a mile long. So we're expecting it to be a very well utilized both um, for people who will live or work um, at, at our site or people from the neighborhood that might utilize this. We've been talking about the possibility of a connection to the Franklin School. We have not in any way decided to do that or not. We want to get feedback from people. We've been talking to people about it. Um, we are, you know, we're, we're open to making that connection or not, depending on what the community wants. But there is the potential to create sort of a new sort of pedestrian route away from Route 114 that would eventually get you out to Andover Street. You can go to the next slide. So this is an image from the area of Quail Run. So again, this so, so, sort of shows the, the wetland area being a little more ponded, but, uh, but in general, this is what we're trying, you know, sort of the elements that we're trying to, um, to really play up here and what we expect the, the landscape design to really uh, to be like. You know, we expect it to be a nice, you know, one of the nice things about Royal Crest as it exists today is the the amount of of nice, tall, mature trees. And in in this area, we want to keep all of those for sure, and uh, and give people an opportunity to enjoy that. While at the same time, again, preserving the wetlands and preserving that buffer to keep keep our site, you know, well insulated from the surrounding neighborhood. So this image is our developing landscape plan. Um, again, for the area to the rear of the site, it shows this new uh, walking and biking path. Um, it, it, it shows it in the purple area here is something that we're developing and it would really um, accommodate four, four goals. Um, it provides some recreation with this new walking and biking path. Um, it provides some wetland mitigation, so we'll actually be adding to the wetland that exists in the yellow there. Um, it provides some visual interest. It's a nice landscape element, and it will actually uh, be part of our stormwater management system that we know is very important um, and something that we'll be talking to you guys soon in more detail about. Um, but our team is really working on the design uh, of these elements to all work together. And we're, and we're very excited about it. Uh, we do have our landscape architect, uh, John Copley, on. Um, you know, if there's any questions on this or any of the other elements, he's available to um, to discuss. But I'll just quickly run through the rest of this, and we can um, we can answer any questions. 
so again, these are just these are these are evocative. These are just sort of give a, a little bit of an of a of a feel of of what the boardwalk in that area could look like. These are a little bit more wide open. You know, as we develop the design, we'll get more site specific images that will go here. But we just wanted to give you an idea of what we're what we're thinking in this part of the site. Uh, this image again shows the connections that we're we're looking to uh, to create. Uh, again, we really want to emphasize the biking and pedestrian connections. We, um, you know, it's very important to us. Sustainability is very important to us and everything that we're planning here. Uh, the to the bottom of this image uh, with the sort of horizontal red line uh, indicates the the proposed uh, multimodal path that is part of the 114 improvement project. So this is almost two miles long and we are expecting to tie into that from our site with two new, the two new signalized intersections. So we're, we're expecting there to be, you know, connect our new green spaces into this new path, create those connections. You know, we're pretty excited about the planning that, that is kind of going on, um, not just on our site and what we could do on our site, but tie it into the stuff that's going on uh, beyond our site, both on the Merrimack campus and to the north and south uh, with the 114 corridor improvement project. Next slide, Jean. So um, we're getting to the end here. I just wanted to touch on sort of the community, the residential community amenities that we that we are proposing, and we expect, you know, we expect this to be, you know, a very um, popular and exciting place for people to live. And people today really want exciting and and um, uh, really robust amenities. So these are specific to the people who will be living at Royal Crest, but we expect there to be, you know, swimming facilities, fitness centers, um, possibly some tennis courts, stuff like that. But, you know, what you would expect for a residential community, we do expect this to be um, a really uh, preferable place for people to live and, and we'll be providing those amenities. And we just wanted to point that out here too. And that is, uh, that's the end of the presentation. I wanted to go quickly through it because I know that it's getting late, but if there's any uh, comments or questions, you know, we're happy to, um, to address them or if there's any other information, we'll, we'll be sure to uh, put it together to get to, to you guys as we go forward. Well, this is Aaron. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on the slide that uh, shows the possible connections for walking and biking uh you described um earlier in this presentation how you you foresaw the north andover community at law maybe utilize the, the, the green space um at least uh the the, the town or, or the you know the the, the 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 one in the front there we go yeah. um so so it it it's it's it, 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 you know, it, it's nice to hear that, that the community be welcome, um, but they got to find some way to get there. And right now, it, you know, 114, it's very car centric, as you said. Um, so it'd be nice to see uh, how we can encourage people to walk or bike. And um, I know there's this new multi-use path that um, eventually will be on 114, but that's essentially I see that as more of use of, as the Merrimack or even the Andover community. I don't see that as a connection to the North Andover community who pretty much resides on the east side of 114. So anything you can do to work with the town to see what options there are to open up um, that access towards Franklin School to get to Andover Street, because I think it'd be a great benefit not only for uh, th that as a means for people uh, in the community to get to your proposed development, but also people that would be living in your proposed development to get to the town common or maybe even to downtown North Andover. Um, I, I, that op as an opportunity, the best opportunity if we're to encourage uh, more wa a walkable, bikeable, you know, interactions in our community versus cars. Yeah, we agree. So it, it exists today. I mean, it's a man-made trail that obviously has been utilized for decades, yep. but it's not formalized. So I think any way we could formalize that would be beneficial. But, um, yep. 
So Mike, to piggyback on that, you show the, the trail itself right in the rear of the property and looks like it dead ends into the clubhouse. Yes. Can that be extended along the back of the dorm area and actually tie into the multi-use path that will be in the front of the property so that it would be an entire perimeter trail? It would connect back at the lower arrow here closer to the office building? I think it is possible. I think that there were some pinch points in that area and I think we were sensitive about backyards on Berkeley Road in that area, but I we will certainly check with the team and see if it if it's possible to sort of continue it there. It you doesn't know, look it, like it would be any closer than the trail that runs behind Quail Run. Yeah. So let me check. We'll see what we'll we'll see what the possibilities are and if there is an opportunity to um to extend it. Great, thank you. Uh, nothing from me, uh, John. Um, I'm fine. Okay, Kelly. I'm good. Peter, anything else? I'm fine, thanks. Jean, anything on your end? No, nope, and I have not received any public comment. Okay, uh, I I don't know if it's because we didn't have as much else on the agenda, but I feel that this was a really um, helpful and worthwhile session. Not that the other ones haven't been, but I think we got through a lot of information and had a really good discussion tonight. So thank you everybody for that. Um, and then we'll just pick up on the 15th. Great, we appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe. All right, uh, Gene, anything else for tonight? No, I think that's it. All right, can we get a um, motion to adjourn? So nope. moved. Second. All in favor, John? Yes. Peter? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Yes, all right. Hey, John, I just, wanna, I just wanna state that that was Peter Boynton that seconded just for Bonnie's 